It reminds me of Dr. Seuss a little bit. <laughs> I just loved writing in different languages ever since I was a little kid. I remember, like, during middle school, I got a copy of the Quran, and I didn't understand a word of Arabic, but I would copy out whole passages of it in, you know, pen and ink just because I loved the way it looked and it became kind of a meditative process. So I do a lot of art now that's language-based. Like, even if it's languages I'm not familiar with, I love recording kind of the learning process of just getting a feel for how their alphabets work or how their writing systems work. So, yes, cuneiform. Like I said, some people read it, pretty much no one writes it, so it was a very unique experience while I was writing it because I was thinking, like, I'm probably one of the only people in the world right now who's writing in this language. Like, even though the Sumerian and Babylonian languages, at least their writing languages, aren't very eloquent, like, there are very few, like, stories or fables or myths or things that we think of as kind of like this ancient form of writing. It's primarily, you know, receipts, documents, government reports. So pretty much all of the things that are written here are things such as like records of sheep or goats or bar barley or recording like you know the weather for that year things like that so it's a very you know economical practical writing language um, well all of these are a single structure it's that I did a pencil drawing right there like the thing oh. in its, in its entirety like an old complex what is that uh, yeah the story behind this is it's right outside of Bainbridge here in upstate New York oh. And yep, and I would drive past it a lot when I was very little and always would go past it and think like, what is this place? It must be like a spirit house or something. It's so strange and complicated. So finally I stopped. You were drawn, but then later you went there. Yeah, finally I stopped one day to take pictures of it and just was inspired to draw it and yeah. So how would you describe that building? Um, well, it was built this is all hearsay, but supposedly it was built in the 1960s by a man who parked his bus off the side of the road and started to build around it, obviously with no supervision, uh -huh. and it just got bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier. It's so complex. Yeah. You know, it took a lot to follow my own inner guidance. Uh, yeah, so um, it's an eclectic mix of photorealism, and then what you're, what you're just speaking of there is... Um, abstract expressionism and what I do is I just um, I put down symbols that come as naturally as possible just sit down with the paint and just just making shapes just natural shapes whatever you know I don't I don't step back and plan it all out I, I step in and I go you know every just whatever feels good with a line is, is what I go with and then I keep putting layers and layers and layers on that adding color um, and, um, and eventually, yeah, I, I let it dry, go back at another layer, get more texture, and eventually it just, it just looks like, I guess, like maps. I, li I like that. Um, Analogy, yeah. Um, so are you still in a phase of experimentalism, or has your brain actually adapted, amended to the process that you wanted? Are you, do you still have to develop this? Mm -hmm. Well, as you can tell from the eclectic uh, nature of, of the show, uh, is a ton of experimentalism. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of different, uh, different things going on. And um, what I'm trying to do is make squiggles and, uh, and, and circles and kind of what children like to draw, uh, draw and paint and try to make that um, sophisticated and, uh, you know, appealing to... Um, like adult viewers and, and it's sophisticated um i think that their presence in somebody's living room w would lend to moments of contemplation or daydreaming um but then you had a piece which is an elephant which all the animals had photorealism but this you started to develop something totally new could you describe that yeah, okay, that, that with the elephant, that's a combination kind of between the, the photorealism of the animals and then the abstract expressionism pieces um, with uh, recognizable imagery. What I, what I did for my process for those ones to, to begin with is I would start, I would just make an abstract piece, um, pure abstract expressionism. You wouldn't, you know, nothing recognizable, just nice colors. And then I would, you know, let that dry and look at it and think on it 
until I would see, you know, certain colors and shapes would just appear to me to, to look like something. And in, in that particular piece, it was an elephant, you know. So I would see an elephant and I'd be like, all right, now I have to make everyone else see this elephant. And then I would go in and paint that elephant and, and make it um, so, so other people could view it. Like, I, don't, I didn't sit down and, and plan to, to make an elephant. It just... Uh, well, you did. You did, but only after the initial foray of colors had been placed on the canvas. Yeah, like I like it would have been cool if um, for for another viewer, like I'm the only one who got to see it before I put in the elephant. But you know, it would it would, the elephant was always there, but it was just I just made it made it visible to everyone. This um, and so since some of the pieces are so vivid and technical, it's it's almost like there's a a right brain left brain uh, interaction working, and I. That's really why I like the elephant because it's sort of unified in the full expression of your mind. That's true. Yeah, the uh, the right <clears throat> right brain right brain versus the left brain uh, is something I I'm constantly struggling with, and that's why I've got the photorealism, and that's purely you know the left brain doing everything properly to make it look a certain way yeah. and planning it all. And then there's the right brain uh, pieces, which are those abstract pieces where it's just like I want you know it's just it's all it's just the motion. Uh, you know, of, of your muscles, you know, it's just, you don't think about it, you just go for it, and, and you, you know, that's the right brain, so when I'm going crazy, I do the, I do the right brain, <laughs> the abstract pieces, and when I feel a little bit more um, contemplative, like, I want to plan it out, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down and, and uh, do something more photorealistic, more traditional kind of style. I think that's something we can all see. You are Jim Garmhausen. Yes, I am. And your work has been all over Ithaca. I've tried to put it pretty much everywhere. It's very popular. We're just yeah. at the Crow's Nest Cafe, and we oh, saw awesome. your blackboard there. Yeah, yeah, yep, uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, that was fun. What I take is um, the, uh, the time that you take to give a perspective for every person that you're drawing. There are very yeah. clear intentions mm -hmm. in these people. It, um, they have sometimes a lot of wrinkles around their eyes, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, darkness, like shut eyes, yeah. slit, narrow, and yeah. to me that symbolizes, uh, you know, so they have a, a predisposed thought in their own minds. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I think for me, uh, the eyes are really a central feature of the face, and 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 then the face itself is that's sort of like the map that. I work on to create a character and the eyes are central you know they're sort of like the key to the map um, so yeah I put a lot of work into the eyes a lot of detail and and every individual character um, I have to feel comfortable with it in order to move on so they, they get worked right yeah and they might not have names but they're all doing something and you could clearly discern a relationship in some of the pictures between mm -hmm. one character and the next yeah, well, I do. I work on that idea of relationships, and and uh, you know, since it's sort of a, since it's visual, I look for you know physical uh, communications between the characters. I sort of set one character up to play off another, so that there is you know this indication a of a communication and a harmony and a relationship. Yeah. Um, is there any chase that we see these? characters in a comic book or anything like that? Well, I used to do cartoons. That's how I started. Um, I was a weekly cartoonist, um, and I just uh, sort of outgrew the borders of the frames. I wanted to work bigger. but Large-style yeah. canvases yeah. is what we have now. I'm actually thinking that I would like to use this size canvas to do something uh, narrative um, in the future, you know, so that one canvas would potentially lead to another one. That's a huge, yeah. lofty goal. Yeah, yes it is. Yeah. yeah. I hope you find time to do that. People will definitely be interested. Thank you. I appreciate that. I hope so, too. Yeah.
think that's also, I, I love both of my home, my, my heart, but there's, there's a liberal intolerance we have in this I mean, We accept a wide range, but not everything. <laughs> If you're going to do a vision board for the population of Ithaca, That's an idea. Now, what, 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 what are the things that we would have to cut out of our, our lifestyle and goals in order to focus on the essence of who we are? Yeah, well, I think, you mean like for the whole population? You're collectively. Talking, collectively. I think we'd want to get clear on the essence of who we are as a community and what is important to us. And I think some of the things that are clearly important to us in their sustainability. The land around here, for sure, is yeah, very and, and it's so creative. And it's, it's so there's so much energy for creating and, and building and nurturing things here. Yes. yes. Um, so we, what we would do if we we're going to do a community one is like gather people from different walks of life and communities from in Ithaca together. And say, what are we really about? That, that you, at the end, you make your own set of symbols for this success stories, for the people who have a real belief in the progress and development of their soul. And a lot of the times, these are images that are profound and that cannot be found in a magazine. Absolutely. Well, that's what I did with soul portraits. That's what they're about, is images from your memories, from your intuition, your dreams, your mother, your mother. And you, you don't have to... When you're clear about the essence of what you want, you will find representations of it other places that you're not expecting in magazines. Even if it's not the intention of the magazine to represent that, for you it'll be fine. That's all that matters. Okay, I accept that. <laughs> Thank you. You, can, you, you, you have to play with it, really. You should come to my yes. vision board workshop and play with it for yourself. I went down to 401 East State Street, the history center of Tompkins County, who had a display for Bob Moog from Trumansburg, the starter of the Moog synthesizer, as well as several other sound recording and amplifying devices. It was a short boon for the city of Trumansburg. It didn't last, but it still made an impact on the minds and imaginations of musicians and writers everywhere. Hi, my name is Carl Whitaker. I'm also a painter. Um, I really like Marion Van Seth's work, especially these abstract or semi-abstract paintings. See, the title implies that it could be an aerial view of a landscape or a cityscape. I like the way that it's abstract, but possibly at least somewhat representational. And I just love the composition, the shapes and the composition in the, this whole series of works, actually. Um, and I like the subtlety in some of the colors. And I'm not being paid or anything to make a plot, but I do really enjoy this work. When you talk about the townscapes, 
What does that really, what are you trying to call to our attention? Well, I was a, I did, I did land use maps oh. for a while, mm -hmm. when, a when great... I was still working. Yeah. So I looked down upon the aerial view. The aerial view, and that's what these are. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's why, that's why they're called townscapes. Well, that's but what Carl Whitaker was trying to tell me. Yeah. Is there any um, message behind the work? No, it's just that I love, I love these big shapes. Yeah. And. It's like a fractal that emerges from the development of a city yes, over time. Right. And, you know, these other ones came along much later. Uh, when I just decided that I would have fun with technique. Yeah. And they don't have any meaning, you know. They're just, they're just fun stuff. Okay. I just get in there and mess around. And, uh, but... But these, I had an idea of, you know, looking down from outer space. From upon, above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On towns. And I've done a whole lot of those, but you can only put in so many of them. So that's why there are only a few. <laughs> well, I hope if you become a spirit, you come down and visit us here oh. in Ithaca. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. I hope I do. I hope that's I what happens. I hope I go up and not down. I, I wanted to use the same colors in a whole bunch of pictures. So I started off with that one, and this was the second one. So there are just four colors, really, in all of them. But it's interesting how you can make different views, different feelings, really with the same colors used in different ways. And this is uh, something, the gray and brown against each other has been immensely popular. Well, for me, it, it is simply an emotional. I have an emotional response to these, to these colors and to the combination of the colors. Um, and I particularly adore <laughs> that little strip of, of sort of gold there. Yeah. <laughs> At home, I have thousands, no, dozens of gold paintings uh, in watercolor and about the color of, of this thing, but a, a little bit darker. It's, it's a marvelous color. Uh, more orange than that, but not orange. Hi, this is Connie Zare, and it's gallery night, uh, 9th of January. We're looking at your pieces. This one kind of reminds me of a forest. These are like sort of twig-like. They're very neat. Um, but uh, could you tell us how you make these? Well, they're flamework glass, and I'm not a glass artist. So these are very, very simple um, elementary forms that I've made with a flame at the Glass Museum. They have a wonderful studio there where you can take classes and you The Glass Museum in Corning? Uh -huh. yep. Yes. Okay. And then and you can rent uh, time at their studio and make anything you want. And that's how I that's where I made all of the glass objects. And then um, we can see I, some I, of these ones they're extremely uh, narrow, very delicate. Yes. Um, As time went on, I began to develop these other ideas, ways of using them. Um, and the, the and you've arrived at the sand now. Um, the sand, I'm from California, and I brought the sand. I collected it when I was visiting Nevada. So I brought the it desert with, sand. Yes, I brought it with me. And one of the reasons I wanted this actual installation was I wanted to use the real sand so that you could see the real color of it. It's a great color. I want to touch it. Yes, well, you can. Over there, there's a box of it, and you can touch I know. it over there. Just don't touch this. Um, and I think it's interesting that the, the glass is clear, and one of the reasons I use the clear glass is because it's very, it's borosilicate, and it's very easy to work with. And since I'm a 
uh, a novice. I didn't want to have to have something that was really complicated. But it, it, it draws the color up into itself. And then, if, I don't know if you can see it on your... Uh, it's drinking the color like a straw. Maybe some of the shots also, will come out. And it's also reflecting the color onto the black and white print. If you, you notice it more on this. Some of them you notice more than others. Because this one is so dark, you don't notice it as much. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, it's a lot about... Um, it vivifies memory. the black and white just right. Yes, the pieces are a lot about memory, um, and the fact that this is this is an actual object in front of us. It's present in our presence, and this is a photograph of something of this in the past. So it's about past and present. Yeah. Um, my my younger son died two years ago, and so I've been really, um, you know, concerned with the idea of someone being alive and in your life and in your presence. So, someone who is um, departed. And then, and then where are they? I mean, in my memory, in my imagination. So this is a lot oh. about, it's a lot about past and present and memory. So, so I, don't you're want, talking... I don't want to dwell on that too much. No. I don't okay. know what okay. people see, but it's very important to me that this is present and that is somehow the past and that, and then all these reflections you know, in our, I mean, we can be, we can be standing here talking about something and you can be, I, we can be thinking about something else. I mean, I can see this, I can look at this and I can see one thing and you can see another and we're looking at the very same thing. And you were saying this looks, reminds I, me of forest, like looks, twigs, sticks. It looks stick. like a landscape. Landscape. It looks like a landscape. But if you turn around and look at that, I think it looks like two figures. For me, those are like two dancers or two friends or two lovers. I mean, so that, you know, I mean, they, and they aren't. Yeah. They're pieces of glass. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't thinking of that when I was making them. I was really just letting the glass do what it would do. I mean, it's not that simple. Really glad that you shared with us. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I noticed Dr. Pamela Moss was Soul Guide. What I help you Soul Guide. Soul Guide, yeah. So I'm not really, um, what I help people do is get in touch with their own deep soul guidance and follow it to live a life that's a lot better than they could ever have even dreamed of. What I'm interested in personally, just my own mission, is to have people be on purpose, to have them be doing what they're here to do and really deeply connected to that and, and, have, and their life will work better than they are. It's not enough just to know what your soul guidance is, although it's very powerful. You have to remove the things that are your obstacles and it doesn't matter where you're starting from in life, you can profoundly transform your life. What my goal is is to help people discover their individuated destiny, mm. and I don't know. That's related, people can, definitely. You know, that's something. In the vision you can experience with utter clarity in one moment, mm -hmm. the next day it's gone. Yes. How do you maintain the path? Well, one of the ways you maintain is by creating a powerful vision board, a visual reminder of that. And these portraits, like this portrait behind you, this is a reminder of the essence for this woman. A powerful woman. Yes. I so pick this one in particular. Yes. And so what, this is one of the very first ones I ever did. And basically, for her, the essence for her, what she wanted, really who she is when she's at her best, is all about transformation, energy, and genuineness. And the thing that's ironic about this is at the time, she had an autoimmune disorder, so she had very little energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And what's been amazing to watch in her life unfold is how even with that uh, autoimmune disorder, she has a huge amount of energy. She just has to manage it. You'll find the images is not with your, your conscious mind, which is like, oh, this seems like a good one, or oh, that one's not good enough. It's if you actually, there's another way you can do it. You can tap into the power of your subconscious mind in a very simple way. If you take a magazine and you know the essence of what you're looking for or what you're about, like let's say it's clarity. What you do is you flip through the magazine really quickly, looking for images that remind you of clarity. You don't have to know why. You just move them out, rip, flip, flip. Oh, there's another one. Rip. You make a pile. And what you will discover is the images you will pick are things you probably would not pick if you were thinking about what that looks like, mm -hmm. but they're very powerful for you. And they're transformational. To look at them speaks to your subconscious mind. And that is how you can create transformation by having this visual reminder of what you want because it deeply, deeply resonates with you. And it draws you forth on your own path, which you couldn't plan from a conscious perspective. The people who were successful were all intuitively following what I came to call the seven secrets to grow your dreams into reality.
The seven secrets of following your dreams into reality. Exactly, to grow them into reality, because I used a gardening metaphor. Okay. And I can tell you what the seven secrets are, if you want to know. Oh, listen up. <laughs> okay. So it's like, I use gardening as a metaphor, because I love to garden and it makes sense. So the first secret is called dig. And that's all about to grow anything. You've got to dig into the ground and you've got to prepare the ground to grow something. And in our life, that means getting really clear about what is not working, where we are right now, what we don't like about it, and what really our heart desires. Not not the stuff we think we should have, like a better house or whatever, but like what does our heart want? Mm -hmm. And from that place of being really clear about the truth of where you are and the truth about what you want, you have the ground prepared to grow something. So that's the first secret, dig. With our minds, we look into our hearts. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. The second one? So the second one I call seed, so planting the seed. And the seed is creating a clear vision of what you do desire, not not what your partner or your boss or your past thinks you should So as a seed, the vision contains the full potential of what you would like to manifest in the universe. And it really does, it really has, and the vision boards that are in this display here are a visual representation of that seed. And they're very potent because they have contained the essence of what that person desires, and they remind them of it. It's an image that is very potent. If you, rem- if you look at it regularly, and you should talk to some of the people who are here who have done this, it just magically shows you new op- opportunities. Like I saw this book cover, and it had this image that really spoke to me powerfully of what I wanted in my soulmate. The image is just so powerful. So I cut it out, and I just looked at that, and it was just the essence of this kind of intimacy and, and divine connection I wanted. So when I met my soulmate on my first date in 29 years, I, I recognized him really quickly because we looked at each other like that. It's like, this is what I was talking about, and you know, now we're married. <laughs> so it's, it's a very powerful way to, to, to know what you're looking for, like you know it when you see it. Watering, yes. Okay. And watering is about taking action and taking inspired action, not things you think you should do, but just allowing yourself to be guided to what's my next step mm-hmm. or what's the, you know, from here. Like, it's so powerful to do that. Yeah. And weed. So weeding is where most people I found were falling down. Weeding is where you have this beautiful vision. Basically, weeding is all the beliefs and fears and doubts and opinions that would stop you from doing it. And in fact, so what are, the, what, are, what are these appear as? Well, a lot of times they're like, oh, that's, that's a beautiful idea, but I, I, don't, I can't do that. You know, like, or I'm not good enough, or I don't deserve that, or I'm too Muses. old, or whatever, all those things. Yeah, so the, all, these things we, all these mean things we tell ourselves are the weeds. And a lot of times we're not aware we're telling ourselves them. Or, we're, or like you said, the people in our lives are like, oh, you know, you can't do that. Like, that's, that's crazy. You're, you know, and the weeds, <laughs> the weeds can be visually appealing. Yeah. Um, but we have to remind ourselves on the seed that we ourselves planted. Yes. Um, and we remember that at the very first digging stage, if those resources are going to be stolen yes. from our original intent, yes. then they're not serving our purpose. Yeah, that's an ongoing process, by the way. <laughs> Every time you take steps forward, you, you, you might face new obstacles. Right. Um, so then the next thing is all about feeding. And feeding is nurturing yourself and creating the supportive community that helps you accomplish what you want. Because it's not something you're going to do by yourself, mm-hmm. even though sometimes the, the openings just happen right away. It's, just, it's allowing yourself to be nurtured, really. Nurtured by your community, nurtured in your relationships, nurturing yourself, nurturing your health, like just nurturing yourself. And nurturing the from the experience of the heart. Yeah, exactly. Because if you don't nurture yourself, you're never going to really believe that you deserve anything, you know? It's, 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 a, it's, an act, it's a declaration of I do deserve what I yeah. desire to nurture yourself and allow others to support you. Yes. So there's two more. So the, the next one, six, is pruning. And pruning is actually... Above the ground. You have been you, you, begun yeah. to grow your vision. Yes. You now it is time to prune. The seed has sprouted. You've been pulling up the weeds. You've been watering it with action. Mm. You've been feeding it, fertilizing it with nurturing yourself and having support and allowing things to you're good to come to you mm-hmm. and then you come to the pruning stage when it's it's gotten to a certain point where you realize like well maybe I have to take a different direction but they're not really failures that's the big thing to learn is, is we think we fail but really what's happening is we have an opportunity to learn something the pruning makes sense that we are taking away the the overgrowth and we're clearing it out so that the fruits 
can manifest. Yes. Yeah, like if you don't, if you have a, um, you know, a tree, a, a, like an apple tree, there's some other examples too. If you never prune them, they just stop bearing. Like they really need to have the life energy go into some branches, not all the branches, or they don't have enough energy to produce a lot. Okay. Do we need to say anything about the harvest stage? It's it's pretty much just recognizing the gifts in life, like uh -huh. seeing that everything is a gift, like even the things you don't like. 